Good morning, good afternoon, uh, fellow audit practitioners, and uh, welcome to the ECIAA webinar on guidance on unlocking the value of internal audit functions by implementing data analytics and data science. This webinar is hosted by the ECIAA, uh, which is uh, to the extent that you're a member of um, country chapter of the IEA, the oversight uh, entity to uh, work with the countries on a European level. Next slide, please. So 34 uh, national institutes are part of the ECIA. That brings together about 50,000 internal auditors. And we think that's an amazing number of auditors we'd like to uh, work with to help bring in new practices to your day-to-day -day life. The vision of the ECIAA is to uh, further the development of good corporate governance and in that context of internal audit at the European level. And we do this through knowledge sharing, developing relationships, impacting regulatory environment. And what we are going to do today is really the collaboration piece. We see a great opportunity across those roughly 50,000 internal audit practitioners to collaborate and finding out how we can do our job in a very demanding environment more and more efficiently and more and more effectively. And that's really the context of the uh, web webinar we are delivering today. Next slide, please. Now, as you attend today's webinar, it's important to also know where you find the uh, information which is underpinning this webinar. And that's the ECIA webpage, ECIA.eu, where you find the uh, thought leadership paper, which is underpinning today's webinar and panel conversation. My name is Martin Studer. I'm the head of group audit at Zurich Insurance Group, and I'm a member of the ECIA Insurance Committee. So I'm very happy to host today's conference and to provide you with a little bit of context before I will then introduce you to the panel and also share some of the um, house rules for today's session. Now let's wind back for a moment. Never before has data and computing capacity be so freely available as it is today. We can do today at our office desks, oftentimes now under pandemic regimes from our home office desks, what practitioners and even big companies couldn't do five years ago. Technology is moving so fast it's important for us as auditors to, uh, in order to stay relevant, to embrace that technological change and to embrace the opportunities technology gives us to be much more meaningful as auditors, as we try and guide our audit committees, executive management and regulatory supervisors on how risk is addressed within our insurance undertakings. Data analytics, science-based methods start to become more and more one of those essential elements in our auditor's tool belt. While we used methods such as process auditing for decades, interviews, and other enablers, it's now the time where we have to fully embrace that data, data analysis, data science, science-based approaches become more and more the language we need to master. Today's webcast and the underpinning thought leadership paper are trying to help you getting your arms around this. We know from experience in our own insurance undertakings that some of the practitioners need quite some time to fully embrace the opportunity because it's really embarking on a new journey acquiring new skills. And today's panel conversation is here to demystify some of the elements around data analytics and data science. I 
kind of invite you to uh, appreciate that the colleagues I'm going to invite to uh, join the panel in a moment, they are practitioners like you are. They come from within insurance companies who try to master data analytics, data science as a core element of internal auditing. So their views are not academic views. They are robust, of course, but they grew from within internal audit, from within internal audit in the insurance industry, and therefore deemed very practical in their approach and the guidance they can give you on your journey. Next slide. Now a few elements to give you to make most out of this webinar. For, first of all, please switch off your microphone unless you're invited to raise your question or to comment. Feel invited to use the chat functions. We use modern technology here. So activate the chat function in your Microsoft Teams environment so you can place questions, comments, and interact on the topic. This keeps the dialogue lively and allows you, allows us to have a richer dialogue, multimedia, so to say, and, and the speakers and the facilitators will have a better opportunity to tailor the Q&A to your needs. So be specific. If you have a question to one or the other panelists more than others, then say so and comment accordingly. This keeps the dialogue lively. And now, next slide, please. To the panelists. It's a real pleasure for me to invite you a group of distinct professionals who not only oversee data analytics and data science efforts in their companies, they are deep in it and uh, know it from within what it takes to roll out data analytics programs within an insurance internal audit activity, which oftentimes is constrained by budget and other elements but who found a way to make it practical. So I'm very pleased to introduce Peter Jones, who's the head of data internal audit at LNG Insurance. Sophie Krenow, functional audit director at Zurich Insurance Group, responsible for our digital journey at internal audit in Zurich Insurance and also overseeing our data science uh, uh, virtual collaborative team. We've got Robert Zergeny, Head of Data Science and Analytics at Zurich Insurance Group Internal Audit, who's been the uh, driving force behind driving data analytics, science-based approaches into group audit for many years by now. And Chiara Ciliani, Head of Group Audit Analytics at Generali. It's my pleasure to have those four colleagues here who are also the author of this thought leadership paper. So they collaborated together to bring their best of thinking to you. And I'd like to now not speak longer, but hand over to the group to facilitate the conversation. Thanks a lot for joining and enjoy. Thank you very much, Martin. And it's a pleasure to have you introduce us today. Um, we're actually gonna start the webinar with a quick poll. So hopefully in a second, you will have an invite within the chat function that invites you to answer the question, do you use data analytics within your organization? Yes or no? Just very keen to understand where um, you're at as an organization right now. But whilst you vote, we will have a kick off the initial questions that we talk about in our webinar today. So Robert, can you start us off with a clear definition of what data analytics and what data science is? Sure, very happy to do so. So in its simplest term, data science is a field that uses scientific methods, processes, algorithms and tools to generate insight from structure and unstructured data and deliver actionable items from data across a broad range of application domains. Data science as a term was only broadly started to be used in 2002 to, to, to describe its modern use, um, which is much broader and includes all aspects of different aspects, uh, such as behavioral science, natural language processing, big data, image, video analytics, compared to the more traditional term data analytics. 
Um, for audit, data science can be applied actually for the whole life cycle of auditing, starting from audit planning, a risk-based audit selection, audit scoping, audit testing, root cause analysis and reporting in numer numerous forms, such as developing a storyline and using visuals for different levels of audiences, including board, management and audit committees. Yeah, so that's in a nutshell uh, def def definition and also how we apply data science um, throughout the whole paper. Brilliant. Thank you, Robert. And Peter, um, Robert referenced to the fact that we can use it in risk assessment and planning. Can you uh, explain the impact that data can have across these aspects of our value chain from the risk assessment, the plan and the process? Certainly, thank you very much. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, so uh, legal in general, where I work, we've taken a view that uh, you can use data analytics or data at every stage of the audit cycle. So if I just talk you through a few different applications that we think of. Um, so, uh, so risk assessment is, of course, one and risk assessments. Uh, not a new thing for all of you in audit. Um, and so when we're thinking about what it is we want to audit, we want to have all of that data information that we know in the room informing our decision making. So for us, this is about being data led. So we have lots and lots of data available to us as we form our risk assessment. There are things you'd expect, uh, risk data, control environment scores, how many open issues there are, how long they take to close. But we're also uh, increasingly uh, making sure that we bring in other data sets from across the organisation. So the customer complaints data set, you know, what are our customers complaining about? How many complaints are there? What are the trends? Or our own internal IT data, what systems are giving us trouble and uh, causing a lot of tickets to be raised? So where have we got those sort of operational, uh, those sort of early warning signs that are operational problems? And a particularly rich source for us is HR data. Um, there are, we have data available on who is or is not completing their mandatory training in order to carry out their roles data on sickness and absences and how many vacancies key teams are carrying uh, and how long they're open for. You know, are we struggling to recruit and are those vacancies causing us problems? So we have this enormous sort of wall of data with us when we're uh, looking at risk assessment and we have to take quite a rich view of what risks to assess. As we move through the audit plan cycle, then there's, there's audit planning itself. Um, and I would say we are getting much better at using data at this too. We are thinking about what systems and processes and by systems i mean it systems are involved in the things that we're interested in auditing so how can we um how can we know in advance what it is we'd like to be looking at and start to use that in the formulation of our test plan um, and another idea we've come up with which has been really successful and which i'd uh, recommend to all of you is the concept of a data notifier so you'll all be aware of audit notifiers you tell the business you're going to start an audit but we found that that traditional audit process of planning, fieldwork, reporting was giving us quite a small time window in which to do quite complex analytics work. So a data notifier is where you write to the business and say, we will be auditing you later. But right now we want you to send us you know, some data sets that will specify so we can have a look. So we've bolted a new phase onto the start of auditing effectively, which is we will take a swim through the data you've got and look for anything that we think warrants our attention. So we might see something positive and everything looks fine and we might reduce the scope of that from the audit, but we might find some anomalies and think, oh, well, we hadn't initially planned to look at that, but something looks up, so we will, and we, we sort of follow our nose and we follow the problems. So data is not only informing the annual audit plan, it's informing the audit specific plan, the scope. Uh, and then lastly, I would say the audit process itself um, you know, so so field work. Uh, so Robert tried to do the really difficult uh, task of defining data analytics, which is an incredibly broad area and can be sort of anything and everything. Um, but within that, we are introducing lots of different techniques. So um, I've talked already about using data to have a better sample. So follow your nose, find problems in that initial look at data and decide to go and, and look at it. So what, that is what we call a data driven sample. So we, we, data has led us to shape the audit. We've also got uh, coverage, of course, you know, with modern technologies, you can look at everything. You don't have to sample. You can do a 100 percent sample and that gives you more assurance, which gives you a higher quality audit product. Um, another very common technique in data analytics is data blending. So bringing data sets together, you may have um, 
an operational process that looks to be you know, very strong and the outcomes look fine. And then you look at customer complaints and find that well, customers are deeply unhappy with it. So, so maybe we're not measuring it right. Maybe, maybe the way we're looking at this problem is wrong. So by bringing different data sets together, you can get a new insight that sometimes people doing the day job in the business don't get because it's you know, they don't have the headspace for that. Uh, a few more things, statistical analysis, of course, there are some really good stats tools. And as data becomes more prevalent, I think statistical knowledge, mathematical skills are more and more a key part of that auditor tool set. And of course, the big one, uh, data visualization. I mean, the, the standard line on this is a picture tells a thousand words, but um, yeah, data visualization is uh, incredibly powerful. So we have taken up the practice of actually putting the visualizations in the reports themselves. And not only that, but we provide each visualization with a unique reference. And when we list the audit issues at the start of the audit, the things we found, the medium and the high risks, we directly reference them to the analytics so that analytics is not bolted onto what we are doing. It is absolutely fundamental to the story we are telling through that audit. Um, so that sort of covers a bit about reporting as well. But the last thing I should mention uh, in, in terms of completing that audit cycle is, is metadata. As you go through this, you will learn more and more about your organization. Work out what it is you want to know from that information. Start collecting the right things so that you will build up sort of knowledge of developing trends. Maybe you keep finding a, a risk and it's appearing in different places in your organization. And maybe you don't realize you've got a thematic risk and then the metadata will reveal it to you. So, uh, so to finish, I would say data analytics takes many shapes, as we know, and it has different applications throughout that entire audit cycle. And there are no there are no bad places to use it. So, uh, yeah, a great opportunity. Thank you, Peter. One of the questions that we were tackling, we want to address as a paper, was why should anybody start on this journey? As you beautifully articulated. There are plenty of opportunities we can apply and, and, and starting it can be quite an overwhelming journey. So we wanted to make sure that it was clear today that we were articulating the benefits to you about how we can take this on to improve um, a better outcome for our key stakeholders. And that ranges everything from the audit committee, the board and management. So I'll walk you through some of them right now. Ultimately, the reason we should deploy data analytics and science is to increase the quality of assurance we provide in line with our mandate. We always have our mandate to deliver, but we can think about new ways to deliver that. And we all know that the core currency of our business is trust. And data science and analytics, if we increase quality, can allow us to increase the trust we have with our stakeholders um, and really drive forward the value that the profession can bring. So if I break down how we can turn um, this ambition and quality increase into some uh, tangible act actions, where does it come from? So as Peter just rounded out then, insightful audit committee reporting, I think is really one of the key benefits of employing data science, data analytics. A lot of the time telling the story of what we've seen on the ground and we've seen in the business can be challenging. So data um, allows us to visualization and the way that we've collected our evidence points provide more context, not only to the findings that we've, we've identified, but also the control environment as a whole. Um, and typically the imagery can replace where we might struggle with words. And we all know that we battle um, on occasions with wordsmithing with our stakeholders while approving reports. Recently, um, we were asked by a key stakeholder how we can add additional value to them. And they would uh, simply said, tell us more about the unknowns in my business. And to me, that's exactly what data science and data analytics can do for our stakeholders. Thinking about additional benefits, it allows us to be more forward looking. Typically, our profession can be seen sometimes as historians of facts, but using predictive analytics, potentially, as Peter described, in the risk identification space, um, really allows us to be more forward looking and really think about how we can use this insight to drive a different dialogue about what is to come rather than what has been. For example, when considering forward looking at um, perspectives, think about how we can use it to drive the, the narrative around change rather than um, a historic look back idea. And data allows us to use lead and, lead and lag indicators about the control environment to really support the narrative we want to have around change. 
Otherwise, we end up using fairly meaningless anecdotes of qualitative nature that data really allows us to give an element of credibility to look into the future. Data also allows us to be incredibly efficient and effective the way that we want to undertake the work of our audit proceedings. And there's a, a it ranges from the basics around standardization of testing and also the productionization of testing. It also allows us to be agile and think differently about what we find and how we want to deploy our resources. I'm sure many of you have finite resource challenges within your functions, so it allows us to be incredibly effective about how we use our skilled people to look at the high value areas um, of professional judgment and risk and allow the machines and the data to do the more standardized testing. For example, you can consider reviewing all your recurring tests that you want to do and replace them with standard data tests or even automate, um, automate them. Typically, we've found that where you are operating in the regulatory space and regulatory testing, where there's rules based, it allows you to really um, automate and use data testing to replace typically maybe more manual procedures. And then depending on the maturity of your function, as Robert described, there are more advanced techniques in the science space that you can deploy to really add a lot of insight and, and value um, thinking about AI and natural language processing, this actually allows you to replace the work of an auditor with a machine because you can ask it to scan documents to look for things humans can look for um, rather than you know spending hours. And, and to give an example, recently um, we use um, NLP to look over 800 documents, um, which was done in a day where typically that might have taken an auditor um, or a human a whole week to complete. So they're the benefits you're really starting to realise in a tangible way. Machine learning also allows us to look at patterns in data and learn and, and change and adapt over time. And so when we think about our requirements around fraud and looking at fraud risk indicators, this can be a fascinating way to drive insight. And there's probably more other techniques you've heard around process mining that can be introduced into your organisation too, that allows you to look at the actual process that, um, that's been followed and following the data rather than the process that the business tells you they follow. So you can really use it to drive scope and um, think about the high risk areas and the professional judgment pieces you want to look at as part of your auditing. And finally, to me, this is really a people journey and I'll hand over to Kiara to talk about what the benefits are for the internal auditors within your function. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, yes, I would, uh, I would consider um, both perspectives. So uh, the benefits for the internal audit as a collective functions, and then for the benefits for the internal auditors as individual professionals. First thing to consider is that uh, um, the implementation of data analytics triggers an upscaling effect. Uh, it really provides uh, the auditors uh, with the needed background with tools and techniques, uh, allowing them to cope with a fast changing uh, environment, uh, which clearly requires a, a new auditor profiles, uh, more uh, data savvy, more uh, technology savvy. And uh, of course, uh, as a consequence, uh, the data skills uh, results uh, in, in deeper business understanding. Things, for example, that uh, by analyzing full data sets uh, in, rather than testing samples, auditors can spot anomalies, can detect patterns, uh, trends, and by doing that, getting strong insight on the business uh, being analyzed. Again, uh, um, by data, using data analytics, they can get a more complete view, extracting data from multiple data sources and systems. So it's kind of an agile way of, uh, of, uh, of doing audit. All this results clearly in a, in, a, in a deeper business knowledge. And here it comes the benefit for internal audit as a, as a collective functions. Deeper business knowledge means being able to meet management expectations. Uh, you can then better discuss issue. You have a deeper discussion on issue. It really facilitates the discussion with, uh, with, with the business uh, stakeholders. It facilitates communication and you can also enhance, if you want, the, the storytelling uh, of the issues through additional tools such as, think for example, of data visualization. And by doing that, the result is that uh, internal audit becomes a more credible partner to the business, is really adding value 
to the business. So the way it, it's a way of uh, establishing a uh, stronger, stronger relationship. Again, efficiency that uh, has already has already been mentioned. Um, as said, data analytics uh, allows uh, standardization of tests, uh, which means uh, capability of uh, reusing, of repeat, uh, of automate. From uh, um, a board and audit committee perspective, uh, this implies uh, um, an internal audit function able to switch for the, from the everyday tasks to the more risky activities, and this is something Sophie has, uh, has already highlighted. But if you think from an individual contributor's perspective, this results in an enhancement of, of the job because the auditor is able to switch from the more routine task to more uh, added value activities. Um, last but not least, uh, I would mention an, um, a human resource uh, perspective. Um, I already mentioned the upskilling effect uh, on the on the auditors, but think from a uh, from the, a function perspective, um, the, the digital journey of uh, of internal audit makes internal audit more attractive on the market. Um, make internal audit more competitive when uh, uh, seeking and uh, attracting new talents with these new uh, digital skills. Then, of course, it's also a matter of uh, being able uh, to develop appropriate career path uh, development plans in order to retain the talents that we have been uh, been able to acquire. But surely, it's um, it, it's really a great benefit from a um, from a, from a people perspective. So, in a nutshell, what uh, I would say is uh, would summarize is that um, an upskill function um, aligned uh, with the with the new uh, digital trends, uh, competitive in the market, uh, more efficient thanks to the use of uh, data analytics, uh, and able to provide uh, deeper insights to the business and by doing that becoming really a, a truly partner for the, our business stakeholders. I couldn't agree more. It's a very exciting career journey if you want to embrace data and the skills. Now, hopefully we should have the results on the poll and they will pop up on screen and to see how you voted between whether you're using it in your function or not. She says, fingers crossed. Eighty-five percent yes. It's fantastic. Thank you, Pascal. Well, that's great to see that so many of you are already embarked on this journey. Um, and for those who haven't started, I think you'll really enjoy the next question we um, will ask the, 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 the panelists. So, if you want to start on this journey or start on it and, and having um, you know, taken the first steps. Robert and Peter, from your experience, where would you start and what what would you really advocate for as a, the first steps forward into starting a data journey? Yeah, I would say that there's really no right or wrong. It, it, it really depends on your organizational setup, um, the size of the company. It also depends a lot on also the maturity of your business, how, how they manage data itself. And I, I really see it as a as a change program, which which takes a certain time. So don't think uh, if you start today, you will be done in in a year. It it will not happen because it's it's quite complex. It's it requires culture change, but also it requires a lot of um, close management with the business. And you also should not underestimate actually the impact you will have with the business just by starting some discussion for example on data management meta data management as we heard of peter um, data dictionary a lot of basic concepts which uh, should be already implemented by the business but uh, often we also found in different maturity levels of organization that data is not used to the level it could be used and audit really can be there a change agent um, what what uh, what we try to demonstrate in the paper and uh, Kiora also has alluded to it's it's really a, a, a 
a people-related program. It's a culture-related program. I think it should be iterative because um, um, often you need to start to adopt uh, a program to see where, where it's really had an impact and where you really see, uh, see elements which still needed to be done. Um, um, often we see companies having several waves of, of, I would say, maturity and data analytics uh, implementation. Uh, and the story is probably never ending because on one side, the technology um, really had a, a, an, an immense uh, push forward. So we can do two-day things we couldn't do five years ago or even, even two years ago. For example, the, the statistical um, um, accuracy of, of, of models in 2010, um, depending on the under, underlying data, were around 5%. And now you're reaching, uh, in, in a lot of machine lear learning al algorithms, very easily 95 to 99%. And we can do today things which we wouldn't think of, of 10 years ago. So um, on, on one side, uh, to, to um, summarize, I would really say start somewhere and start with um, hiring skills and upskilling. So it always be will be a mix. Um, start with transforming uh, your um, organization culturally and make it iterative. So I, I would really say that's, that's kind of the three um, takeaways how to start, but also how then try to uh, manage your data analytics and data science program throughout the life cycles. Um, Peter, your your intelligence and insights. So I would say you know, there are a great many set of skills within uh, data analysis. And if you say to anybody, should you use data in your business, they're probably not and say yes. I mean, that's, that's not really what this debate is about. It's about how we use it. There are data scientists and that's a very sexy term, uh, but you know, data scientists need a huge amount of data to get the best out of them. If your business isn't ready for that, you don't want a data scientist. You might want something a bit earlier up the maturity cycle. So what I would say is most places I've seen and worked, the, the, a good first step is data visualization. Tools are relatively cheap. There are lots of them. I won't recommend any here, but you know, Gartner and others will provide recommendations on who are good in the sector. The great thing about data visualization is you just need one analyst and a desktop computer and a data set. It could be an Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't matter. If you can create something impactful um, on your desktop that makes someone in the business say, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. We should change that. You've had an impact. So I would say data visualization is a great you know, bang for your buck, low cost, high impact way of starting off. That way you can test, is our data even viable for this? If one analyst on their desktop cannot create anything meaningful because the data is so bad, then what you need is a data engineer or, or some sort of data warehousing practitioner or somebody to sort it out. So you need to assess where you are in terms of data maturity. Um, and a really good way of making that assessment is to invest in a handful of you know, licenses for viz tools and have a play, see where the opportunity lies. I would just add to that, that if you can do something impactful that saves your company money or makes them money or takes risk out of the business that will buy you sufficient credit to do a few more experiments and a few you know, if you have one good win it's a really good way of getting going so choose wisely and uh, pick something valuable this is a great time to ask both of you who've both been on this journey for some time and with 85 percent of our participants being on this journey what does success look like is there a bar that we're all aiming for? Or I don't interested interested on your view on this one. Yeah, I can I can uh, start with that. I mean, success is really how our stakeholders per perceive, you know, the insights we are giving, and uh, uh, we are we are as an audit function. We we work actually for for normally the owners of the company. And, and we, we try to identify major risks, either business is already aware or business is not aware. And I think the major successes are really the elements where nobody was aware and we could highlight risks and we could actually um, start um, impacting uh, the business, the control environment, um, the strategy to a level where um, it really mattered. It, it, 
on one side, it, it mattered hopefully on the financial side, but also on the risk uh, taking side uh, and the overall business performance. So I think that's that's really where we as, a, as an audit, audit function could could have uh, the major in, impact. And that's really the successes we see. And we, we try to celebrate these successes as well. I mean, these successes, all our teamwork efforts um, in data science, nobody alone uh, will be able to to bring you know a very complex topic to to top management. So it 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 really needs everybody. It needs a business analyst. It needs somebody with with very close business knowledge. It needs a very good data scientist actually connecting these dots dots also from a business perspective. And then it needs um, presentation skills, visualization skills to really make an impactful story, which then is a change agent at the business. I would, I would say that's really, when, when that worked, that really uh, were the, the biggest successes uh, we, we saw. Peter, your success. I would second, I would second that last point. You know, I, I will say this, it, it dangerous in this company, but I'm not an auditor by trade. I'm a, I'm a data, data analyst, data scientist, whatever you would call me. And I've joined an audit function. Um, I may know a great many data and an analysis techniques, but that would be utterly useless without somebody asking me good questions. So you need, you absolutely need a business person and a data person. You put them together, and that's where the magic happens. Um, in terms of defining success, uh, that's a tricky one because there are lots of different things you might do. For you, depending on your role, your success might be automating your monthly reporting pack. And then that looks very specific in terms of you made a time saving. I think generally as a group of audit professionals, what we want to do is add insight to remove risk from our businesses. And insight's really hard to define. What is insight? It's, I think it's something that nobody else knew. So this comes back to the maturity of your organization again. If your organization is a bit of a mess data wise, you may create insight from simply joining two data sets that haven't been joined before. And that's valuable in a very large, complex organization full of actuaries that know their data very well, being insightful is a bit more challenging and maybe you need to take a different approach. So success is uh, probably defined as being insightful and being insightful is probably defined as being one step ahead of what everyone else knows. And it's only one step. You don't have to be a you know, rocket scientist. You just have to have uh, discovered something of value. Even, that thing, if, even if that thing you discover is positive assurance that there is no problem, if the way you did it was very robust, large sample, if it adds more assurance, it's still a win. So it's about finding where the gaps are for you. So I would say last thing on this is if your second line is very good, the opportunity for audit as the third line is slightly lower, whereas if your second line is stretched very thin, there's more opportunity. So where your opportunity lies depends very specifically on your organisation and where those gaps and need for insight are. Thank you both. Chiara, one of the things we um, wanted to make sure the paper conveyed was how to overcome some of the key obstacles or challenges that we faced while implementing uh, our data analytics and data science journey. What insight would you provide around embracing the, the speed of implementation and, and taking it forward as a, for the function? Yes, what I would say is that to start, uh, you need uh, you need to have a, a clear strategy and the vision of where you want to go, and uh, how you plan how you plan to get there. Together with this, uh, a roadmap of I don't know maybe twelve better twenty four months would be would be something meaningful. Um, th the fact is that uh, you need a strategy, you need a plan because if you simply wait for things happening. That would not work. You really need to to drive the change, to have a plan, and the plan must be based on multiple aspects. First of all, you need to have a team of people with the right skill set. Then you need to have appropriate tools, technologies to support the journey. Um, you need to have an an organizational model, an operating model to support the journey, and then you need the strong sponsorship and communication. I think these are really the uh, the foundational pillars uh, from where uh, everything everything starts. And then 
uh, you implement on that uh, uh, your roadmap and your roadmap again suggested maybe a couple of years time but this roadmap must be uh, fed with uh, I would say with quick wins so with uh, with deliverables uh, relatively easy to achieve but at the same time powerful so powerful to demonstrate a tangible value uh, to the auditors something really able to prove the, the the success that you can get if you if you implement data analytics this is really key in order to onboard the community um, to to have the people on board because uh, uh, we need to recognize that sometimes it's a bit uh, of a challenge have, having everyone on board you, you might really expect to face especially at the beginning some a, a bit of resistance a bit of resistance to change I think all four of us have talked around the fact this is actually a very much a people change journey and we can be very distracted by the fact that it's maybe a data or technical journey. Um, resistance to change is just, I think, for me personally, a fact of life around change management and embracing it um, is really key and, and going with the ways of change. What advice would you share with, with the participants of this um, webinar around how to tackle some of the common pitfalls of change management in this space? Yes, yes, it's a, it's a probably the, the underestimation of the chain of the resistance to change is probably one of the most common uh, common pitfall. Pitfall. The fact is that it might be quite challenging for auditors to um, accept the fact, gaining acceptance of the fact that uh, data analytics is becoming the, the new normal. It's not something exceptional. It's something that is uh, trending towards being part of a natural part, a natural component of, of every audit. Uh, in my experience, uh, there are three elements which are uh, absolutely key uh, to overcome this. The first is uh, uh, continuous communication. I would also say over communications to some extent. Uh, the second is uh, um, having an inclusive approach. And the third point is uh, uh, deliver practical examples of, uh, of tangible value. Um, about communication, you really need to regular cascade uh, the strategy, uh, cascade your vision, uh, share uh, the progresses you have made on the roadmap, uh, share the, the success. This is really key to um, set a positive tone in the community and maintain people focus people they need to understand why data analytics is necessary it's not something that comes automatic so you really you really need to to drive this communication uh, and the fact is that the more you communicate the more it becomes part of the normal second aspect is uh, um, inclusive approach people must feel to be part of the journey not something that is simply cascading from the top. One thing a uh, company might do is to leverage on champions, for example, uh, to get closer with the local team, to promote the use of data analytics in the local teams, but also to gather the feedback of the local team. It's a two-way communication, top-down and bottom-up. And receiving the feedback from the, from, from the local teams, you can adjust the journey where appropriate. And third point is, uh, um, delivery, uh, the, uh, giving a practical example of uh, uh, delivering tangible value because communication is key, communication is necessary, but is not sufficient if the people, they do not see something back, something concrete back, uh, simplifying, simplifying their, their life. Uh, that's why I, I mentioned before that the implementation plan, the roadmap must be fed with quick wins, might be also simple things, could be the selection of, a, of the proper audit to run as a pilot, could be the selection of a tool, uh, an appropriate use case, but you really need these uh, simple elements to convince the people that uh, the change is, uh, is necessary. That would be nice. And then of course you have uh, another number of challenges that <laughs> you might face a change resistance is, uh, is, is the first uh, um, from the people, but uh, also from the business, for example, sometimes. I don't know, Sophie, what, what's your view on that? 
Well, I think that the advice that you've just shared around how to convince our internal audit function applies very much to the business. And I don't think the message you have around communicating translates to both all stakeholders and, and where we're at and why we're doing it. And I suppose, you know, there are two routes you could go. You could say that you're audit and therefore in, entitled to see all the data in the business. But really, one of the benefits we talked about earlier was about how we can be move along that trusted advisor journey and really add value back to the business. So I wouldn't advocate going that route, but how you can find collective benefit and collective insight to um, enhance the control environment. Most management really will want to know more about what they are looking at. So take process money, for example. It's fascinating for us as internal audit function, but also for the first line, how they manage their risk and manage their insight. Why wouldn't you want a tool like that and do it in collaboration with your assurance partners and how to drive it forward? I think the one thing we haven't talked about today that um, will definitely come up on your change journey is um, how to manage the data quality challenge. And I think my advice to all of you would be just accept that uh, over the what, matter of whatever stage you're in within the journey, that um, you'll come across data quality challenges. And maybe to resonate the point that Peter shared, it's about how you can um, add insight through those challenges rather than just say, well, we don't have the data, therefore we can't do it. Maybe the business wants to have the data too, and they can really think about um, how together you can both benefit from improving that quality or think about new systems or whether it needs to be centralized, um, whether something can be um, an audit finding could recommend taking something from a manual um, finding to a, a, an automated finding, which helps everybody in, in the long run. So I think when you come across data quality challenges, take it as an opportunity to really add value rather than seen as a as a barrier to do maybe what you thought you'd do in your change strategy and your ambition um, and, and embrace the fact that things will take longer than you originally hoped and be OK with that. That's always my lesson with change management is um, you want to go quickly, but actually sometimes things go at the pace that they're designed to go at that is completely outside of your control. So celebrating the small wins and um, the little milestones you make will really help champion people taking it forward. Thank you for your for your views, everybody. Um, I'm going to hand the mic back to Pascal now. Hopefully there's lots of questions. Um, in the chat that we can answer your questions on how you feel about the paper or um, what you'd like to know more from all of us who've written it and, and why we wrote it. Th thank you, Sophie. So we have a few questions about the internal audit department composition. One is about a centralized data analytics function versus all auditors being data savvy. And another question about the same problematic, I would say, is about the impact of data analytics on the internal audit composition. So maybe may I ask you, Peter, to tell us what you think about that? What is your recommendation? Uh, yeah, two great questions. Um, I think in terms of the composition, I'll share this with you. I was at a presentation by PwC last week. They're one of the big four consultancies in the UK, and they asked exactly that question, how are you all setting up for data analytics? So this is a UK based answer, but what it said was 50% uh, of organization uh, audit teams has created a central function, 7% have created an entirely federated model where there is no central function at all, and the other 43% have done a hybrid, so there's something in the centre but also something spread out. So the sort of takeaway message from me was that 93% of audit functions in the UK have some sort of central analytics function. Now, that doesn't mean they're right, um, but it does mean that that does seem to be a very standard way of starting out, uh, and then you can assess it and see how it goes. So I think that's well worth thinking about. So that's the sort of structural model problem. You know, what, what structure do you want to set out? When you've had a few guys on their desktop test this out and you think there's value in it, how do you build it? The standard approach appears to be start with a central function, use those people on a small number of audits, see what value you can add. Um, then you get into what I call your operating model challenge. So how do you want to operate? Do you? So what 
I have done with my team is I've taken uh, what we're calling an audit first approach. So I've uh, we got all of our auditors to self-assess in terms of their skill with data analytics, but also their desire to do it as a big part of their job. And then we took the sort of three people with the highest combination of skill and desire and brought them into a, a new central team that I lead. And the, we use it as a sort of internal consultancy pool effectively. We, we allocate those individuals to the audits on the plan with the highest sort of data analytic need, as it were. So with the most complexity or high volume data that we think will need specialists, and then we, we train them. But there are other models, you know, there are, you could hire data scientists and then teach them about audit. I've come into an audit function. It's not impossible to pick it up. Um, or um, another change that we have made, which I would say is worth thinking about, is we have changed our job descriptions. So all new hires now have to demonstrate skill and analytics. So we hope to see an evolution of um, we don't expect every single auditor we have to become brilliant at analytics, but over time we expect to have more higher proportion of data analytic capable auditors. So it's well worth thinking about your sort of succession planning and, and your sort of how you're going to bring talent in. But what does it look like? Are you hiring? If you're looking to look for auditors who are also data scientists, you're going to struggle. There aren't, there's not a lot of co cross correlation there. It's growing, but they're like gold dust. So you need to decide are you going to train your auditors or are you going to bring in data scientists and bring them on the journey of understanding audit is, is a decision I think you need to make. Um, is there anything else I want to say on this topic? Do, 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 do. I would say, uh, yeah, have a think about, so one of the challenges I've found is, so I've created a small team and the question is, what do we want from that team? Do I want them to just do analytics all the time or do I want them to do analytics, help with the audit planning, do the field work and write up the report? Because I get more, you know, I, if I go with pure analytics, I get quite a lot of uh, man hours doing analytics, but they don't develop in the other areas of audit. So are you creating all rounders? Are you creating auditors of the future who have analytics alongside all their other skills? Or are you having specialists embedded in your team who drop in, do the analytics and leave and you have traditional auditors to do the rest? There's no right or wrong, but there's a series of decision points. What's your structural uh, setup? what's your operating model and what are the actual tasks you want from your different roles uh, and there's a lot of permutations within that so yeah have a think about what best meets your needs but I'd say those are all key considerations. Thank you Peter. Uh, I think Robert that that you have some tips or so regarding the, the difficulty to hire the right skills and to find the right skills and and there was also a question going on about what are the trainings that, that you would advise for the new data science? Um, yeah, definitely. What, what I strongly believe is uh, that we should have a mix of upskilling and bringing uh, new people into uh, the teams really to achieve uh, the best. And uh, um, what, we, what we saw um, is that it it, it's very helpful to to hire actually a, a bit the mix of data scientists and business skills all all together. Specifically, if you if you start more or less uh, on the scratch, um, with, with that mix um, you get the results very quickly because uh, the data scientists actually bring and then with the business acumen and business understanding with him, and uh, and also help can. Uh, help to establish, uh, I would say, a first team. And what also is helpful for that is actually then they can start upskilling your your whole audit team. So um, that's, in my view, quite an uh, elegant approach because you will actually mix them uh, to bring new people and upskilling uh, together. Um, we are, as audit teams, we are really in com competition with, with, with all the big firms uh, out in the market, the Googles and the Amazons, uh, we see that uh, really in our, our recruiting. And what in my view is very important is that uh, we, we give the data scientists uh, a, a very good career path with, with our companies, because uh, um, with that competition, if we don't give them a, a good place to work, uh, a good future, a good uh, um, career path development, um, the, the risk of uh, uh, Losing these these data scientists with just quite scars in the market is is uh, is big. 
So uh, I would really say um, um, doing a mix of upskilling and, and new hiring and uh, and have a really a good model of, of uh, career progression is, is, is key. Th thank you, Robert. Ta time is running, so I think I need now to give the floor to Martin for the conclusion and, and share also with Martin a very interesting question we just received, which is, what is the biggest win for internal auditing using data analytics? The floor Absolutely. is yours. Absolutely. And, and, and first of all, thanks a lot to the panelists for really providing thought provoking input. Maybe just a few points I picked out. Um, data science, data analytics is not only about the testing. It, it, it runs across all the elements of the internal audit lifecycle from risk based planning to scoping to testing to root cause analysis and then ultimately communicating results. So you can expand the ideas for where you want to use it. Uh, there are different techniques, there are different applications. The, the group didn't really drill into the tools to use because there is such a vast majority. And I think the focus should be on what's your strategy. And, and uh, Yara made a very good point on this one. Uh, I think the question on C central, decentral, there is no answer to it. We tested with both. For example, we started more central approach than outsourcing than central again, and finally ended with a from within model where we have a really federalistic model where, where we've got specialists sitting in all parts of the world and train our professionals and hire for skills. So it's a journey and you need to decide what fits best to your company. Uh, finally, I think two points uh, on people. It is a people journey, it's a change journey to help the audit practitioners, but also the recipients of our service understand what this can do. And this comes to the question Pete uh, raised in the chat. What is in? What's the biggest win? And I'd like to refer back to a comment Sophie made. It is to move from being perceived as historian to be a timely commentator and, and provider of, of uh, important insights for management and board action. And that's really it. And, and I think that's such a tremendous opportunity. When we seize it, then we will make group audit, internal audit, a, an integral part of, of the governance which is still lively, which is modern, and which is running and perceived to run with the business. So that's really it, I think it is. There is no big bang, it needs to grow. So start rather now and the compounding effect will bring you there over time. I'd like to come to a close here. And first of all, I'd like again to thank Peter, Sophie, Robert and Chiara for first of all, drafting and writing the paper, which I find utterly insightful and for hosting this panel. I think you've done a wonderful job here. I'd like to thank the ECIAA who uh, provided the infrastructure and gave the opportunity to bring these messages worth sharing across. And finally, to all of you who dialed in, roughly 250 people joined today's uh, webcast. Uh, that's great. If you inspire 10 more, then it will be two and a half thousand by the end of this day, which I think would be a good target. Thanks a lot for joining. Keep on it, keep your focus on it. Don't relent to bring this center stage within your internal audit functions and have a good day.